Jones and I'm Toy Thomas. It is day two of me teaching this little guy all about the influences in my Eternal Curse series. I am getting him ready and boning up for the sequel that's coming out on May 16th at the Tidewater Comic Con in Virginia Beach. Here I am dressed for the con back in October, but this time around I'll actually be part of this event and Dallas is so excited. Come on Dallas. We're ready to get started here. Dallas has written some questions for me to answer to help them better understand the Marvel influences in this book. So, here we go. Good question, Dallas. Well, I've always liked the Marvel Universe. It's my second favorite comic book universe. I think what's really cool about the Marvel Universe is that it kind of takes place in reality. I mean, there are real places you can visit. I mean. Spider-Man lives in New York City instead of um, Metropolis, so, you know, there's that. But I also think that Marvel has a lot of very kind of endearing, really real characters that you can relate to. They're kind of deep. Um, not that the DC characters aren't, but I just feel like sometimes they're a little, you know, grittier. That's not to say that um, characters like the Joker don't have their moments where they're just straight out crazy, but um, to me that's more fantasy and Marvel can be more realistic. Can be, but it does go into outer space with, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, so, you know, you have that. <laughs> well, Dallas, I'd have to say um, the mutants, um, the Hulk, Blade, and two specific X-Men characters of Nightcrawler and Angel. Well, when it comes to Marvel's influence in my story, the mutants play a very big part. I think most teenagers can, at least at some point in their life, relate to the mutant characters. We're talking human beings who, at puberty, mutate into something else, whether they want to or not. I mean, they're not aliens, they're not science experiments gone bad, they're just humans who are stuck in some kind of evolutionary chain that they can't get away from. And that kind of relates to the Eternal Curse story because all of these characters somehow are connected to humanity and it doesn't always work out for them. <laughs> then there is the Hulk. Hulk is probably my favorite Marvel character and he's another green character. I got a thing for green guys, I guess. Um, the one thing I think that stands out with Hulk is that no matter how much good he tries to do, He'll always be misunderstood, and I think that's a direct reflection to my characters, Giovanni and Valencia. Um, If you think it's not easy being green, that it's not easy being gray. Then there is Blade. Blade is a comparison kind of like Superboy. What's so great about him is that he's half human, half vampire. Um, he's a daywalker, and if I told you why my character Giovanni is envious of him, it would totally give too much of the story away. And then finally, there are two specific X-Men that really speak to me when it comes to influencing the Eternal Curse series. First is Nightcrawler. Um, this character is so, to me, lovable, but he's also very controversial for it seems everyone else. I love the fact that he looks like what most people would consider to be a demon. We're talking spikes, the tail, you know, the whole thing, he looks like a demon but he's far from it. He um, is an adamant Roman Catholic, which I think is absolutely amazing for a comic book character, and I'm not even Catholic myself. What it boils down to is that Nightcrawler is hated by people because, you know, he's a mutant. He's feared by people because of how he looks, and people think he's annoying because he's Catholic. That character it reflects on so many of the other characters that you find in the Eternal Curse series, specifically a number of my half-breed characters. Then there's Angel, aka Archangel, or Angel of Death, depending upon which one of his stories you're reading. This character is a lot like Nightcrawler, only instead of looking like a demon, he looks like an angel. The thing that's so difficult um, to kind of grasp about this character is that even as a reader reading his story, he looks like an angel, but he knows that he's just a human with the mutation. And it's kind of hard not to expect 
certain things from a character that looks so angelic. And so it's kind of his burden to bear, which that's in a direct relation to what my character um, Bletsian goes through, looking like one thing and being something else entirely. Oh, and there are two X-Men. I must mention, they, they don't play a big role in the influence of book one, but in Eternal Curse Battleground, you can see the similarities between Storm and all her majesty. And then, of course, there's a correlation between my Giovanni Bletsian characters and Wolverine and his awesome claws. Okay, well, I'd say the um, X-Men story the Blade story and the origins of um, Nightcrawler. So I'm going to start with Blade's story. It's, it's kind of really cool, but it's also really tragic. Um, Blade is pretty much abandoned at birth, but not because his mother's a horrible person, but because she dies giving birth to him after being bitten by a vampire, which of course you know, turns things into motion that allows him to become the character that he is. And I have kind of a similar dynamic happening in book two, specifically where a character's birth is just this, you know, event that takes place. But it also kind of relates to the birth of my character, um, Giovanni Bletsian. Then there is also the origin story of Nightcrawler, which is kind of similar. His birth is very tragic, but unlike um, Blade, he was intentionally abandoned because when he was born, he looked like this little demon and his people didn't want him. It was literally the kindness of strangers that saved his life, which of course gave him his positive outlook on life. And that's a direct correlation to the origin story of Giovanni. He almost didn't survive his birth for almost the same, exact same reason. And then there is the overall X-Men story that I think just speaks volumes to the whole idea of surrogate families, um, adoption, kind of a new wave, you know, um, family view. Basically, you have all of these humans with mutations who are no longer accepted by their families, and so they only find acceptance in the company of other mutants. And then there's the whole idea of Xavier School for Exceptional Youth. These ideals play a major role in both book one and two of Eternal Curse. In book one, we find that Giovanni and Mira, my main female character, are both orphans, just not of the same caliber. And in book two, um, this whole idea of adoption and surrogacy goes to a whole new level. Okay, Dallas, you put me to the challenge again, so here I go. I would say in terms of Marvel, Eternal Curse, Giovanni's Angel would be a Blade, Nightcrawler, and Angel kind of mashup character that's on a quest to, um, you know, find its place in the world, but it's also trying to decide if it's worth it considering the state of humanity and, you know, whether or not he believes in God. All right. Well, that's all I have for today. I don't want to overwhelm this little guy, but I think he has plenty to keep his mind busy. And so my next episode, which is going to be all about Star Wars. So if you like what you saw today, don't be shy. Go ahead and check the links below to get your copy of Eternal Curse, Giovanni's Angel. And if you want to know more about my influences, you can also check out my companion guide, 40 Days and Nights of Eternal Curse chock full of stuff just like you saw in the video today. Also, I have some very cool uh, Pinterest storyboards packed with, you know, dream uh, soundtrack ideas and actors who could play these characters, so be sure to check that out. And you can follow me on Twitter to join the conversation. If you can think of a book or a movie that you think was influenced by something else, let me know. You can use the hashtag influence and there might be a surprise waiting for you. <laughs> and also, remember, the sequel, Eternal Curse of Battleground, will be releasing on May 16th at the Tidewater Comic Con in Virginia Beach, but it will also be releasing online. You can pre-order the book now ahead of time and get it before everyone else. And um, that's pretty much it. I'm so excited. <gasps> there is one more thing I forgot. Do not forget about my pre-order giveaway. I will be giving away a $25 Amazon gift card 
and some other cool things. So be sure to check that out in the link below. Yeah, Lucy. Bye bye. I'm tired. We'll have Come to back. Make sure.